Well, there's a lot of really good up and coming young trainers in, in Ireland at the moment, both on flat and jumping. And this morning, we've come up to the historic training grounds on the Curra to visit one of the really up and coming young trainers, his former jockey, and now the master of Clunmore Lodge Stables here in the Curra, Robbie McNamara. Well, Robbie, it'll be two years this April, that fateful day in Wexford that you took, obviously, the horrific fall with horrendous injuries and obviously a life-changing experience for you. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, took plenty of uh, getting used to, I suppose. First couple of weeks were actually fine because I was so doped up in medication. Uh, I broke a lot of bones and um, obviously done plenty of stuff to my insides as well. Um, so I was in a lot of medication. Reality didn't really sink in till about week five or six, and for about three or four weeks, then it was very, very tough. And um, then it was kind of uh, in Dunleary. Then I got there, kind of things picked up a bit. I was a bit busier. I was doing more every day. Uh, I was doing a lot of physio. I was working out. I was feeling better about myself. And each weekend, then I was allowed to get home, and um, you know, it kind of forced myself to go out and do stuff. And uh, it wasn't nice at times going out. Um, it was like a child going to school for for the first time. I, I was that nervous going to pubs and stuff like that, and um, just doing things that I it was getting I was getting out of my comfort zone. But I kind of knew I had to do it if I was going to get on every weekend to get out. I tested myself a bit more and just kept going. I was lucky. I had a brilliant family around me. Uh, brilliant friends. Same, same friends they always had, um, so I couldn't, just for my family and friends made everything an awful lot easier. And uh, no, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy, but um, I got through it, just, just, there's worse things in life, and um, I can see a perfectly normal life now, um, get on with everything, my, just get up in the morning, it doesn't, doesn't come into my mind from one day to the next. Um, Busy here, enjoy, enjoy doing what I do, and no one takes pity on me and get on with it. It all was planned, it kind of a day it set in my head to go training. So, working in Nesson Stud for a good couple of months and loved it there, had a great time there. And um, I set up training then and made the first. Um, I'd made the first in my head, but we actually made a second because it was a Monday. Couldn't get the boys to start on a, a Sunday morning. So, uh, we now I kicked off and made a, for, made a second and uh, haven't looked back since. I remember meeting you, I think it was around a month before that day in Cork when you had your first runners and you said to me, you were Gary O'Brien down in Cork. I said, I'm not anyway, I don't think Gary is either, but I'm not sure. He said, one of you better be down there because he said, in a month's time, I'll have my first runners and I'll have three winners. Yeah. And I kind of walked away thinking, OK, Robbie's a little bit mad maybe today, but you were nearly right. You had a double and you were unlucky not to have a treble, were you? Yeah, Calvini was second. Um, with four, four of them went down. Uh, we fancied three of them. Um, called Vinnie, we thought, would finish fourth or fifth. Um, the first fellow won, then the, the second fellow who we thought was the, the best bet of the day, um, flush or bust, he went down and the ground went a bit soft for him. He's a little wind issue. And he'd have finished third or fourth. He, got, he nearly got knocked down, turning in, he finished seventh or eighth. But uh, no, the other two, Chaddick and Rackannon won, and called Vinnie was second, and the other fellow let us down a bit all right. But I had that in. We had, I had that in my mind. I, I didn't have horses in, in the yard um, when I had that day in Mallow picked out because there was, there was maiden hurdles and a bumper and um, I just picked that and I kind of went away and bought horses for that day. Um, so it was kind of, it was a long time in the planning but luckily it came off. I, I'd said to my father that uh, it, it'll, either, it'll either work on Sunday or, or the whole career won't work because I had the horses fit and ready and I was happy with them. And, if, if if they didn't win that day, I wasn't going to make it as a trainer because uh, I had done everything went swimmingly and I I put a bit too much pressure on myself because I actually didn't enjoy the day. Uh, when Chadwick won, I, um, he won the first. I actually looked back at it a couple of weeks ago and I enjoyed it more watching it back than I did at the time because everyone was, I remember my mother was there crying and everything. And I still had a lot more business to do that day, so the pressure wasn't off. I enjoyed Rackannon winning the bumper all right, but... Um, no, I kind of, I was doing when I was riding, I used to put pressure on myself, but it's not a bad thing to do at the same time. Keeps your, um, keeps your sights, sights up and uh, makes you strive for a bit more.
And it was good to get off to such a good start because obviously it generated a lot of publicity as well and it puts you into the wider public's mind and you're trying to attract new owners in and hence you've got 40 horses in training now. Yeah, well, I've, um, I, was, I was kind of confident of getting the horses in and the owners in. Um, I had a few people there like Ron Lamb, he was very good and Michael Worcester, he came in out where I can and he's got a few more since. Um, but I kind of... It was actually kind of more for myself that I wanted to do it than um, the training career. And it, I, it just drove me mad that people were taking pity on me. Um, and I just wanted to give them something else to talk about. So, and, and it's been grand since, like, for two months after, we're going to oh, congratulations in Mallow, rather than coming up and going, oh, how are you feeling? It's good to see you out. And, like, I, I, I know they only mean well, but I didn't enjoy it. And uh, it's, it's nice since everyone I meet now, they all have the training going, well done with the horse Christmas, you know, and stuff like that. And, um, like we, we got quiet after the, after the first day in Mellow, but I, I knew that was going to happen because we didn't have anything else in the yard to run. Um, but it was it, obviously for getting the, thing, the ball rolling was the big day in Mellow, but the main part of it was for myself. And you want to be known as Robbie McNamara, the trainer, not Robbie McNamara, the ex-jockey in a wheelchair. Exactly, yeah. no interest in that. I know it was always your intention to go training horses. It was always your intention to go training on the curl. Um, when I was younger, I always my father had 35 or 40 horses at home. I was always mad keen into that side of it. I was 12 stone, I was 15, I was playing rugby. I tried riding for a couple, well, not even for a couple of years, for a year or two, and I tried to have a bit of fun, and um, it worked, went a little better than planned. I tried quite successfully, yeah. I would have thought. And uh, I kept at it, and um, kind of a couple of years in then, I started to, I was in Dermot Wells, and I started going to different places, riding out then to Desi Hughes's, to um, Jessica Harrington's, to Willie Munnell's, and I went into all these different places, and like I was never really going to get many rides out of them, because they had their amateurs, like Patrick was going to ride all Willies, and Kate was going to ride a lot of Jessies, and um, it was just going in to see what, what they were doing, what way they were training the horses, and, um, kind of to see what all the stuff that they were doing right, but to see the stuff that they were doing wrong as well. And Dermot Wild, for argument's sake, obviously I work there as well. A great man to learn from, isn't it? It's a, it's a great yard of it, the, the way everything runs. It runs like clockwork in there. It does, yeah. It's um, it, it just the mentality of um, his horses. You, you'd struggle to to beat it anywhere. He keeps everything. He wants everything to be, be relaxed. Doesn't like anything being keen. And uh, everything around the yard is kept the same. Everything's nice and relaxed. There's no roaring and shouting. Everything's done and on time, and it's um, it runs like like a factory. And uh, that's uh, one of the, the biggest things inside there was the, the mentality of his horses and obviously the staff because he liked everyone getting on and he was a very fair man to work for as well. And if I asked you the, a couple of key things that you learned from, firstly Dermot Weld. If I asked you for two key things you learned about training horses from Dermot Weld, what would they be? Um, the mentality of horses, keeping them uh, happy in themselves, and also at time. Um, he was brilliant that if a horse needed time, like Forgotten Rules was one, took his time with him. He was a naive horse and he kept him until he was a four year old, and just slowly, 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 everything was about confidence with him. And he was brilliant to give a horse time and just to fill him up with confidence. Um, just to, he, he was so big into the mentality of um, the horses, keeping them happy. Um, that would be the, the biggest thing I take from his. And Robbie, you're predominantly national hunt at the moment. Is that the way you want to focus going forward, or would you like to get more into the flat side of it? Um, well, we're kind of I've between two year olds and three year olds now. There's 15 horses there, um, and there's probably the rest. Then there's about 25 national hunt horses. So there's there's not much of maybe 65, 35 um, the national hunt side of it. I obviously, my heart would probably be more in the, the National Hunt side of it, but I love the flat side of it as well. Um, it's a, a lot a lot more straightforward in that um, there's a lot less variables. You don't have to worry about school and you don't have to worry keeping horses sound isn't as hard. Um, but we do a lot of work with the, the yearlings and two-year-olds. Um, we we'd take our time and build them up, a lot of muscle. You see all the sprinters there, the Usain Bolt and all them, they do massive work on uh, core fitness and you need muscle to have power so 
we do a lot of work with um, the, the flat horses and, and building them up and having them good and strong. You bring in these horses from the sales, that'll be a store horse or, or a yearling, you get them broken, what's the process then? How long, you know, how much long, steady work do you do with them? Uh, before, before, like the, the yearlings, the yearlings that came and the three year olds that came, uh, the store horses, they all did the same. Before they decided to let them, they were, they got bungees on and uh, they were straight on the water walker. They started on the, the normal walker for about three weeks, slowly built up to about 40 minutes and then we have a water walker inside and they'll, they'll end up being about six or seven weeks on that and they'll be getting bungees on everything. You see the horse this morning, every one of them, big backsides and uh, they'll do all that and that'll be before they'll ever get a rider on their back. So they're good and strong. Uh, it's fun for the lads to ride them because they've uh, a bit of power when they, they give a buck and squeal the first day, but um, they, it, it just stands to them. I found with all the three-year-olds, when I, I put in the, the base fitness into them, I was able to give them slowly, slowly bring them along, and any bit of work you give them did come on from it rather than fall away. Um, there's very few I had to give time to because once you have the core fitness in, they'll take it and improve rather than you give them a bit of work and they'll fall away to nothing. We're lucky now. We take uh, I see uh, using the the heart monitors. Uh, the first first good maybe six or eight weeks out out cantering, everything's just real steady. Just getting them to relax, to carry themselves properly, and the we take it real nice and steady with them, and then we slowly integrate the heart monitors into them. Then once we start doing little, but just to to make sure that we're not doing too much with them, we take that at a lower base. We keep them to about 190, and um, just to make sure. Um, you're not doing too much, but like between the, the all the two year olds or all the yearlings we got, all the the three year olds, um, not one of them has gone lame. Robbie, your six horses gone out here now. They've all the bungees on them as well. Will you just explain to people who will be watching this uh, feature that don't know what bungees are? Um, they start off from day one. From day one, they get them on. They're um, just a piece of elastic rope and they, they go from the bit and they're tied onto the girt and uh, it just gets them to, to, to bend themselves properly. You see all the venting horses and show jumping horses, they're, they're the most powerful. You need, you need power behind and that's what the, the bungees do, it just gives them a good top line, strengthens up their neck and their backside and uh, it just, you see all the horses, they walk around with their, their heads in the right place, um, they're all using themselves properly, it makes them just uh, move. If, if you ever see a horse that's shuffling and you put a pair of bungees on him for six weeks, you, you'll see that he starts using himself a lot better. So, it's just with, with the bungees and the good riders, you, you'll see all the horses, every one of them will they'll travel away, but they'll, they'll be relaxed at the same time. And do, do your horses ride out with bungees on them every morning? Every morning, they're their school and they're doing a bit of work. They'll have them on them every morning, from, from day one, from the day they're, they break and tack on them, they'll have bungees on them, and none of them resent them. They're good and tight now, those bungees there. I say the older horses, they're, they're nearly all four-year-olds now, um, but they're, they'll go around like handicappers now, they're, they're four-year-old bumper horses. And it makes horses work as well. Some horses that can get laid back in their in their daily routine, it just makes them work, doesn't it? Well, I hate seeing horses just, just cantering away with the, the heads out in front of them. They can be doing exercise, but they're not using themselves. Same as a fellow going to gym and not knowing what he's doing. He's not working the right muscles, so... Once you, if, you, if you get horses carrying themselves like that, they're, they're building up the muscles in the right places. If you don't have power behind, that's where the power of a horse galloping comes from his hind quarters, so you need them as strong as you can get them. Well, Robbie, we're here at the Water Walker, and your, your last three horses that'll be ridden out this morning are just getting loosened up on this. How long have they been on it? Uh, these now will stay on maybe in nearly an hour. I wouldn't put a horse on too, too quick without doing enough of them. They'll do. They'll get up to about an hour in the walk, normal walker first, and then we do 20 minutes in this. And every 10 days we'd step them up maybe 10 minutes. Uh, Robbie, you're very lucky here. There's obviously a, a spa here as well that you have the use of as well. Yeah, um, there's, there's every every sort of facility. It's very good for for getting horses fit and strong. You have the gallops that are brilliant for doing whatever you want. But if you have a horse that that's a bit troublesome, it's hard to keep sound. You're not going to find a better place in the country to do it. Uh, you have every Every amenity, you have the spas inside, there's two spas there, you put it to whatever temperature you want. You have this, you can get a horse good and strong in this, you can get a horse fit in the swimming pool. Like, you, you can get a horse 90% of the race course w without, without seeing the gallop. Um, so just the, the last little tweaks, you'd obviously have to go out and, and, and do them on the gallop, but like if you had a horse with a bad set of legs, um, it is a, 
it's an unbelievable place to, to train a horse like that. How many have you got in at the moment? Uh, we have 39 or 40 in at the minute, um, so we're busy enough, but there's, there's room for more. And uh, obviously it's a massive place. If you ever wanted to build, it's a, you, you have more than enough land to, to add on. So well, if anyone's interested in sending a horse, now, we have more than enough space for it. And would you like to get bigger, or are you happy I with the numbers have. you have? No, no, well, I'm happy with the numbers I have, but uh, I would like to get bigger. You saw with the heart rate monitors this morning, they monitor everything, they do a lot of work in the evening, so I put horses with certain horses so that they're, they're, not, over, they're not overtrained. Um, so as, as long as you've, uh, you can keep a good enough hold of that, um, I, I, the one thing I'd be afraid of is overtraining the horse, having, having something in at the deep end when he should be getting a little more time. But with the heart rate monitors, you're able to see that. Um, so it stops you from overtraining them, so I, I'd have no problem getting bigger. Um, just the one thing I'd like is to get the staff to come along. You saw the, the, the staff, they're second to none here, and uh, I wouldn't like to get bigger unless I had the, the staff to come along. So, um, But it's, it's a great place to work, the lads enjoy it, there's a great bit of crack, there's no, i never ever given out or anything like that. Horses are good rides, they're nice horses, so everything's straightforward. Um, so it's, we, we, we'll, we'd like to get a bit bigger. That's great, you have the likes of, obviously, of Dr. Ronan Lamb in the yard. You're quite a few winners for Dr. Lamb when you're in Dermot Wells. And also Michael Worcester, he's a name that was missing from racing for quite a few years. Obviously, he was best known as the owner of Mr. Mulligan, a Cheltenham Gold Cup winner for an all chance. Yeah, uh, it was funny how I came. I never met Michael and never rode for him. Um, it just happened that um, Johnny King was working a horse of his, uh, Rat Cannon, up here one day. And uh, he worked nicely with a couple of hours. Um, he worked. Yes, he worked behind the horse I taught a lot of. Um, so I, Mr. Michael Worcester, ended up going and buying him, and uh, I pleaded with him to, to send him here. So I met him for dinner, and he sent him here. And he's, uh, I think he's five horses here now. So he's um, he's had three runners. Two of them have won. The other fellow was the four-year-old that ran in Nace. Robbie, you've a lot of unraced, unexposed horses in in your string at the moment. Tell us. Uh, about a couple of your bumper horses, obviously Quick Grabham and Rat Cannon are the two headline acts at the moment, but you were telling me there you have a lot of nice four-year-olds to look forward to. Yeah, I have. Um, we've uh, one fellow ran in Nace there, he ran a good race, he was fifth first time out. Um, uh, what's his, um, Cosmos Moon is his name, Michael Worcester owned him. Uh, we were a little disappointed with him that day, um, but he'll, uh, he goes to Newbury for a, a listed bumper in the, I think it's the 10th of February. Um, but Quick Grabham will go over the day after he goes to Exeter as well. Um, and Rat Cannon, he'll have a run and he might go to England if there's nothing suitable over here, he goes to Entry. But we have a lot of then horses that haven't ran. Um, this fellow here behind me, uh, Golden Oriole, uh, he's a Goldwell horse. He's a, he's a six year old actually, he just needed a bit of time. But uh, he's, he does everything very nicely. Um, there's a, a horse there, um, Epsilon Indy, uh, he's, in, he's by Ask. He's, he seems to do everything very, very easy. Uh, he's a lot of speed, he's kind of classy. So we'll, uh, he's a tall, leggy horse. We'll, we'll, I was trying to get him to Leperstown, um, but he we went to do it another few weeks. So there's a, a nice race in Punchstown around the 20th of February. So we'll aim for there. Um, but there's a, there's a lovely bunch, kind of whatever we have running. There's a, a mare by Midnight Legend, um, the lads who owned Jet Setting, owned her. Um, She's a half-sister to Drake, or Aidan O'Brien had. Um, she, she, she'll go for a listed bumper first time. she got a lot of allowances, she's a four-year-old. But whatever, whatever we have running in bumpers, none of them are useless. Um, they'll all, whether they'll win first time, they'll, they, they won't be far away from... Um, they should be placed anyway. They know their job and they're fit, um, but a few of them for sale as well. Yeah, and you have a couple of two-year-olds in as well. Have you many two-year-olds in for the season? Um, I think there's seven there altogether. Um, the seven two-year-olds and the six or seven three-year-olds as well. Um, there's plenty of those for sale. Um, bought a couple there to go to the breeze-ups. I uh, wouldn't mind keeping any of them. Um, the three of them are lovely horses, but uh, um, at the, the minute the plan is to go to the breeze-ups with them. They were bought to go there, so Barry get an owner to come in and buy them. and That's where they'll be heading. And quick grab them. I read, I think, two weeks ago that you're not even entertaining Cheltenham this year for them. Um, originally, originally I said no because uh, he was very weak and very immature. Um, I went to Mallow, he ran well the first day, and he, went, he grew up a bit going to Leperstown. Um, but uh, at the time I said no, and he ran so free. But he is, he's done very well, he's strengthened up, he's got a lot stronger, he seems to have grown up mentally. And the plan isn't to go to Cheltenham, but I'm just going to go, we're going to go to Exeter. 
and uh, I think it's the 11th of February. Uh, there's a normal bumper over there he can run in. Uh, I'll bring him over. If he travelled, if he went and won impressively, at least we have the option of going to Cheltenham then. But I'm not going to... Um, I was being honest when I said that he wasn't going to go to Cheltenham. I didn't think he'd do as well as he's done. He's strengthened up, he's, he's grown up. And uh, we'll, we'll go to Exeter, and if, if he won impressively, at least we have the choice. Uh, we'll give ourselves the option rather than run him four weeks later and try to rush him to Cheltenham then. So, um, at the minute, the plan is still go to Punchestown, but if things can always change. Rat Cannon, when will we see him back in action? Rat Cannon, he'll go maybe the middle of March. Um, he's done, he got a little operation done in his back, a few kiss and spine, so he's got an awful lot stronger. And I, I, just, I couldn't be happier with him. He's go same, and might go to England with him uh, in the middle of March. Uh, if there's nothing suitable here, there's nothing at the minute. I've been chatting to Michael Grassick trying to get a, a suitable two mile bumper put on. Um, if not, I'll go to England and he'll go to entry then for the, the entry bumper there. He's a lot of speed, he's a fairly classy sort. And of all your unraced bumper horses, give us a name for the at the races viewers to watch out for. Um, you can give us two if you want. I'll give you two. There's Golden Oriel here behind me, Ron Lamont's him, and uh, the other is the Epsilon Indy, the horse by Ask. Um, two of those. But there's, there's not much between a lot of them. Just keep an eye on the bumper horses. The, if you'd a few quid each way, and I said it in Leopardstown, if you'd a few quid each way, and a whole lot of them, you wouldn't be going to bed.